Good evening. Uh, my name is Ashok Kamath and I am with the IIT Alumni Center in Bengaluru. And welcome uh, to all of you for our 49th webinar. We started the webinar series uh, since the first you know, pandemic wave in April 2020. Our first webinar was on black holes and Stephen Hawking. Uh, our 20th was delivered by England's Ron, uh, Royal Astronomer, Lord Martin Rees. And today the 49th is on a very exciting related topic uh, on LIGO uh, with two uh, outstanding uh, scientists uh, today with us. Uh, telescopes uh, from the time of Galileo have you know, been a source of a lot of interest and uh, you know, from Galileo, we you know we had we had better and better telescopes, and then we moved to uh, you know space-based telescopes like the Hubble, and now uh, very soon the James Webb Space Telescope will be operational. And all of these new tools uh, kind of tested the limits of technology, and there were some remarkable spin-offs uh, that came uh, that could be applicable. Uh, outside of telescopes as well. Uh, the LIGO project is another great example. While it set out to prove some of the predictions from Einstein's general theory of relativity, uh, the approach lent itself to developing and improving multiple technologies in many ways. Uh, LIGO, which is a laser interferometer gravitation wave observatory, there are two large observatories uh, built in the US to detect gravitational waves by using laser interferometry. And they use mirrors that are spaced four kilometers apart and capable of detecting a change of less than one ten thousandth of the charge diameter of a proton. So you can imagine you know, how much precision goes into all of this. Uh, so in 2015, uh, viewers will uh, recall that uh, uh, gravitational waves were first detected. Kip Thorne, Reiner Weiss, and Barry Barish uh, got the Nobel for it in, Nobel, in, uh, in 2017, I believe. Uh, and today we will learn more about this. We have uh, you know, two uh, accomplished scientists, uh, uh, I'm not going to go through their bios because uh, you've seen that all in the mailers that we sent out, but uh, delighted to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Tarun Savradi, who's just taken over a, a few weeks ago as the director of the Raman Research Institute here in Bengaluru. Uh, he's uh, an engineer from, uh, did his BTEC at IIT Kanpur, and then switched over after a brief stint in industry into uh, gravitation and cosmology, uh, well, spent a lot of time in IUCA uh, near Pune. And uh, now, of course, he's in our own city here in Bengaluru. Many, many awards, you know, we don't want to go through all of that. Uh, and he's our speaker today. And moderating for him is another interesting young person, uh, uh, Ajit Parmeshwaran, uh, who did his graduate and undergraduate work in the University of Calicut, and then his PhD from the Max Planck Institute in Germany. Uh, today, he's uh, at, I mean, right now, he's at the International Center for Theoretical Studies, ICTS, in Bangalore as well. So, uh, you know, uh, we welcome both of you for this, uh, uh, you know, webinar today. Uh, I have a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. K.S. Narayan, Professor K.S. Narayan uh, from the Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Research, uh, my colleague at IIT Alumni Center, Bengaluru. Uh, a few couple of housekeeping rules, please, if you have questions, do not put them in the chat box, put them in the Q&A box, which is the one that will be monitored by Ajit as he asks the questions. Uh, so, so that will be the appropriate uh, place to put it. And uh, uh, for everybody's information, this is being recorded and a recorded version will be available on Monday on the YouTube channel of uh, IIT Alumni Center Bengaluru. So these are the rules that we just, uh, you know, 
you can, by the way, see the previous 49 webinars also on that channel if you want to. Uh, I'm sure some of them will excite you uh, as much as it uh, excited all of us in putting this thing together. So without further ado, uh, may I hand it over to uh, Dr. Saurabhip uh, to take this forward. Tarun, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ashok. Uh, let me begin by thanking the IIT Alumni um, Center of uh, Bangalore to have uh, you know, given me this opportunity to speak to you all on something that I uh, have been really pursuing over the last decade and more. And uh, two of my uh, you know, main interests uh, that I have been pursuing. And I'll be trying to give you a glimpse of uh, why they're exciting to do. And uh, the thing that Ashok mentioned uh, that any scientific quest uh, actually is deeply linked to technological progress. And these uh, quests are successful just because of technology. So coming from IIT where there's science as well as technology and uh, you know, this alumni center, I think uh, it's appropriate uh, to be emphasizing that. And by and large, this is something that I believe uh, should be really recognized uh, in, by the society that uh, these scientific quests, uh, which may not have immediate uh, returns, do have very, very big returns in terms of the technology that they push. So let me uh, open and share my slides. Um, I think you should be able to see them. Can you see the slides? Yes, yes, it's okay, excellent. Okay, so I'll be talking about uh, two quests uh, for looking for gravitational waves. Uh, gravitational waves themselves are something uh, observationally recent. And uh, so I, I would like to convey what the excitement was. So one involves colleagues uh, in the country who are part of the LIGO India uh, collaboration. And, uh, and then another one, which is another uh, consortium of Indian cosmologists for the second quest that, so the first one is well underway. The second one is a proposal, but I think uh, you would find them interesting. So let me talk about why gravitational waves are important and, you know, not getting into too much detail, but telling you that, uh, as most of you know, in common parlance, that Einstein revised our understanding of space and time, and uh, more so in terms of thinking of gravitation, not as a force, but as a manifestation of the curvature of space time. Okay, and these came in rapid succession. So basic idea that space and time are uh, inherently linked came with special relativity in the first decade of the you know, 1900s. And the second one followed with the idea that not only is space time related, but space time is dynamic. So just like everything that I'll talk about, you should imagine space time to be some kind of a magical, uh, you know, kind of uh, surface membrane, uh, which can respond to matter. So uh, Wheeler, uh, who is a great uh, scientist in this field, had a very succinct way of saying this. So matter tells space-time how to curve. So, you know, the space-time around, say, the sun is determined by the mass of the sun, okay? And that determines orbits of Earth because that space-time tells other matter, the test matter, uh, what is the path on which it should move and it moves on the straightest path. But that is uh, general relativity and that's gravity, but in a static setting or stationary setting where if you have matter in motion, then just like uh, if you imagine the surface of a pond and if you move a stick in it, it creates ripples. 
And so motion of matter, rapid motion with you know, highly dense and compact matter uh, does create detectable space-time ripples. And that is how we are opening a new window to the universe, which is as new as you know, our understanding the electromagnetic signals from distant uh, objects like when Galileo pointed his telescope could be measured. These gravitational waves travel at the speed of light um, and are very similar to electromagnetic waves. And what is very qualitative unique about the prediction of gravitational waves that goes well beyond Newton's gravity in a very fundamental way is Newton's gravity does not accommodate these ripples. It just doesn't have the space to do that in terms of what the, uh, you know, uh, what it deals with mathematically. And so this is now directly verified. Although we believed that they would exist and there were uh, indirect evidence, but uh, the 2016 announcement uh, by the LIGO scientific collaboration is the first time that we could tell everyone in the world that gravitational waves exist. And that's really, phenomenal because what it tells you is you can look far away into the universe and there could be two massive bodies and there are two neutron stars moving in an orbit around each other. And as they move, they churn up space time so that there are ripples that move out. If these bodies are dense enough like a neutron star is, and they are towards the end of their, uh, you know, very close to their coalescence. The speeds and masses are such that they generate gravitational waves that can be detected at Earth many, many uh, million light years away. And that's what happened with this first event. So in a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, actually a billion light years away, uh, if you looked up at the Milky Way of that galaxy or the distribution of stars in that galaxy uh, very carefully, you would have found it pockmarked by these two black holes. And these black holes warp space time so much that the stars behind them, you know, you can see the distribution of stars in uh, this side versus what's happening here. It's clearly churned up. You know, it's like if you sprinkle some chalk powder and stir up a fluid. Uh, that's how you would follow the motion of, uh, uh, you know, the motion of the fluid. It's something similar that uh, LIGO collaboration used to visualize what was happening. So two black holes like this would not just remain, you know, in this steady form because, you know, gravitation will pull them towards each other and their relative speeds would make them orbit each other. And this is what was happening. So as the black holes were coming closer, uh, they were losing energy and coming closer in their orbit. You can see the amount of dynamic, uh, you know, dynamism that is seen in the space time around it uh, from the image of the stars behind. And you see that the black holes finally merged and then they formed a single black hole. And just wait for it, you will find a little shiver just after the black hole has settled in, okay? And this whole event was conveyed to us through a new medium, new messenger in astronomy and astrophysics, gravitational waves at the speed of light. And we saw this event in the detectors in, uh, at our LIGO detectors in the US and on 14th September, 2015, few days after the detectors were switched on. So what we saw was that there were two black holes, they merged and formed a single black hole. They sent out a signal, which actually is in the audio frequency band, and you could convert it into a sound. And, you know, you'd find this sound in many of the, uh, you know, media uh, galleries of uh, LIGO. But I wanted to tell you what was important about this. Why was it heralded as the detection of the century? Uh, because it was the first detection of gravitational waves, direct detection by an apparatus on Earth. 
and it was also the first detection of a black hole. Although we have been talking about black holes for a long time, we see very strong evidence of black holes in X-ray. This is the first time you know black holes as black holes should be in the theory of gravitation. Okay, and astrophysically, these were this was also the first detection of a black hole binary system. I should mention that this is not a field which is uh, some completely new to India. Uh, we have been involved, so I told you about this little shiver with which the uh, black holes, the final black holes, settled down. That's called a ring down signal, and that was. Uh, predicted by C.V. Vishweshwara, who was a scientist in, at Raman Institute. But before that, while he was a, a, a graduate student uh, or towards his postdoc in the US and Maryland in 1971, he made this first prediction. And then there was a group at Ayuka, uh, Pune, uh, led by Sanjeev Dhurandar, which worked a lot on how to detect these signals, because these, as I'll tell you, are extremely subtle signals, and they usually are buried under uh, much stronger noise. And in this institute, in Raman Institute, there was an extremely active group led by Professor Balayer uh, with French collaborators, which made very careful predictions for what the black hole signal, uh, black, a signal from a black hole coalescence or a neutron star coalescence would be. So this is called source modeling. So why is this field so exciting? It's not just something new and this thing, it's also dramatic. It's, it's kind of physics at the extreme. And there I would point out what has happened in this event itself. And you know there have been many events after that. You imagine a black hole uh, of 30 solar masses, so you imagine uh, the mass of the sun is about 10 to 27 kilograms. A mass of that kind, 30 times that mass, packed into the size of Bangalore, a little bigger than Bangalore, and another one of comparable size, 40 solar masses. They merged to form a black hole of 67 solar masses. Okay, And before they merged, they attained velocities if you look at the velocity versus time during that event, the black hole relative velocities ex were very close to the speed of light. They exceeded half the speed of light. So imagine such immensely dense objects moving at the speed of light and colliding with each other. This is, we know there are protons which collide in the Large Hadron Collider, but here uh, nature provides you 30 solar masses of uh, uh, you know, matter colliding with each other, right? And this produced one of the most energetic uh, events that we have ever detected in the universe. So in this 0.2 seconds, three solar mass worth of matter was converted into gravitational wave energy, okay? And if you convert that into luminosity, that is like 10 to the 49 watts, one order of magnitude less than 10 to 50 watts, right? And the luminosity equals all the electromagnetic emission of all stars in the universe taken together. There's this other exciting thing that happened uh, amongst the many events that have been detected is the collision of two neutron stars. Neutron stars are, are rather more interesting to astrophysics says because they have a surface, they have actual neutron matter at very high densities packed into the size of the sun. And these two collided in a similar fashion. And apart from the signal being detected in the two detectors uh, in the US and one in uh, Europe, this was immediately seen in, by one of the gamma ray satellites in the orbit, okay? And then that allowed us to really follow on with many, many observations at optical uh, and other uh, near infrared, infrared, and uh, so much so that there were 70 observatories which were involved 
uh, in following up this event and what happened, the remnant of this event. And uh, I should also specially mention that uh, the giant meter wave radio telescope uh, played a long, very important role in the follow up about many months after this event had happened to see what kind of physics must have happened in that uh, during that event. So at this point, uh, we have about 90 uh, CBC detections, compact binary coalescences, and uh, Uh, and then uh, there are these black holes which have merged and formed other black holes. You can see visually two black holes merge and form big ones. So we have now evidence of black holes of sizes about 160 the mass of the sun, okay? And then you compare it with black holes we knew existed or inferred from X-ray observations, and these are in purple. And you can see everything that we knew before this field opened up uh, was well below 30 solar masses. Uh, in fact, uh, not, I see nothing above 30 solar masses. And then most of this blue ones are something new for astrophysics. We know black holes exist. And not only that, they exist with such huge masses. OK. So my main goal also is to not talk about the science. I hope I can, I, in this brief part, I convinced you that the science is very exciting. But what makes this science possible? Because the challenge is, as Ashok mentioned, is to measure the displacement of two mirrors placed four kilometers away at the level of 10 to minus 18 meters, which is called atometers, right? And again, it was mentioned that it is four orders of magnitude smaller than the charge radius of a proton. And that's what is written in the slide. So to get to this quest, to fulfill this quest, technology had to go far beyond what we see in daily experience. So in daily experience, we look between megameters, which is your uh, travel between US and India, to you know, millimeters. And then, of course, there's atomic physics going on, nuclear physics going on, going up to 10 to a minus 15. Gravitational waves required displacements to be measured to probe uh, things at the length scale of atometers, 10 to a minus 18 meters. And this is where science goals force technology to go beyond what is possible. And the uh, three people who got the Nobel Prize in 2017 for this discovery uh, actually represent three aspects of any such quest. So Rainer Weiss is the person who came up with this idea of the detector that could detect these signals and you know, pursued it till uh, is pursuing it even now. And uh, you know, uh, very active even during the first detection and later. Professor Kip Thorne, uh, of Caltech, uh, Renaways is from MIT, Caltech. Uh, Kit Thorne is the person who worked out uh, what gravitational waves would bring in terms of scientific returns. And he was kind of the uh, father figure, figure leader who fo forced this uh, you know, kind of community forward. And the third person is Barry Parrish who belongs to a particle physics community. But he was as vital, in my opinion, as these two, because he managed the show. He got these you know, thousand scientists and technical people to work for a single goal over two decades, where the most of the time there were no signals, right, to keep them motivated and keep them working in a very disciplined fashion. And so rightly so, these three were awarded the Nobel Prize. I should also mention that there was a breakthrough prize given to the entire collaboration. So people like Ajit and I uh, you know, really treasured this medal that we got as a part of this. And we were amongst 37 authors from nine Indian institutions. Uh, we, were, we featured in the discovery. And this is where I think getting into a quest uh, in the Indian context 
uh, has huge returns because now, you know, for the first time you are people in large numbers in India working on absolutely frontier science uh, with the most frontier apparatus. Okay, so now let me describe the apparatus. So what happens when gravitational waves passes through space time? Suppose there is a lattice of uh, masses. As the gravitational wave goes through, the masses move around just like you would expect waves to disturb corks placed on the surface of a lake. But if you follow the motion of a circle of particles on this, you'll see that it follows this kind of a dance. It's moving from a circle to an ellipse, which is squeezed in one direction, then in the orthogonal direction. The best apparatus we know that can measure such minute displacement is laser interferometer. And these are things that many of you or most students in India would have experienced in uh, undergraduate labs. These are Michelson interferometer uh, with a lot of bells and whistles, but I won't get into that. But there's essentially the idea is this laser light coming down split into two paths. And if the path difference uh, is created in terms of one mirror moves in, another mirror is stretched out like uh, the particles are being moved then you get a signal that can be detected, uh, even if these movements are minuscule, right? Even compared to the wavelength of the light. Okay, so there, it is not a tabletop experiment. So to achieve the sensitivity you need, you have to set up things which are four kilometers in size. And there are two such detectors operating in the US at Hanford, uh, Washington State, and Livingston, Louisiana. And these are the pictures of that. And they house one of the most spectacular kind of physics apparatus. So here are the, some of the vacuum structure, and you can see there's, deep, there's some person there for scale. The massive vacuum infrastructure that is uh, housing the path on which the laser travels, this thing travels four kilometers, the vacuum tube is hidden under a concrete uh, cover. And, uh, you know, inside the vacuum tube, uh, there are optics laid out and these optics are amazing. So first of all, to even set up the optics, you need to garb up like a, as if you're in operation theater and sit there for hours, you know, fixing them to the right, uh, you know, a position and uh, in, in a confined space. So this is, you know, ex exciting as well as quite daunting. These mirrors themselves are unique. The surface specifications of these mirrors are 100 times better than the best telescope optics that is used around the world. So these are 40 kilogram uh, single crystal, you know, mirrors that 34 centimeters in diameter. So pretty massive object, you can't lift them with your hands. So you have special uh, things to lift them. What you should note is a small figure of error when you have the surf looking at the surface. The surface is smoother than the wavelength of the light by a factor of thousand, okay? And this has really motivated Indian laboratories to you know, take up this challenge to get to such surface specifications at the top labs that we have here. How we hang the mirrors is also interesting. The 40 kilogram mirror hangs on, believe it or not, glass fiber. So there's a glass fiber which hangs the 40 kilogram mirror. And, you know, it's not this metal structure. This metal structure doesn't touch the mirror at all. And this hangs from a pendulum system which, uh, you know, uh, technically I would say has very pure note and that's very important to isolate it from mechanical noise, okay, of the mirror itself because a room temperature object like a mirror uh, has vibrations which are much, much larger than the scales that we are trying to probe. And this is a very intricate system, very unique, uh, built by a lab in UK. And uh, I should mention the mirrors themselves are cast in one country, polished in another country, and coated in a third country. And it's not just to share the load, 
It's because the best labs do not exist in one country for doing all three. Okay. Uh, then there is a very ultra stable narrow line with mirror uh, laser, which was designed and contributed by the Albert Einstein Institute Germany. So you can clearly see the globalness of this entire effort. And what is interesting is a 180 watt mirror uh, laser, but you know such numbers maybe you would have heard of. But the main point is the laser is extremely pure in wavelength. It is very narrow line width. It has exactly one frequency and the width around it is sub kilohertz. So it's part one part in a billion width uh, relative to the frequency. And these are again unique. And this sort of is a picture of this laser system sitting um, there. And I won't go into detail, but the way we will start off uh, LIGO India and already LIGO US parts of that have been implemented is that we would do quantum measurements. And this is really mind boggling that we would look and harness the quantum mechanical nature of the mirrors to our advantage. And this is something that many of you would have heard the buzzword of quantum technology, quantum uh, you know, precision measurements uh, that everywhere in India is uh, going around quantum computing, key distribution, all these use you know, uh, technology and you know, kind of methodology very akin to what we use in LIGO to improve our detections by harnessing quantum uncertainty. Now, let me get to the Indian part. So on about a few days after the uh, first announcement, uh, the union cabinet uh, gave the go ahead to a proposal which we made in 2011 uh, to build this LIGO India uh, similar detector, but on Indian soil. And the picture that I'm showing you is actually 3D from architectural drawing and is on the exactly the terrain that we got from ISRO uh, surveys of uh, you know, ground survey, Cartosat data. There are four lead institutes uh, which are responsible, like India, the uh, Institute for Plasma Research, which, which will be responsible for the vacuum infrastructure, uh, Raman, uh, Raza Ramana Center for Advanced Technology, which is um, uh, in, you know, will do all the optics inside. Uh, the director of construction of DAE, which will set up the you know, civil infrastructure that is required. Remember this length that you see here is four kilometers. And this campus is about 600 meters uh, square. This is a slightly close-up view of the main central lab. Uh, this is about 20 meters in height, single floor. And this will house vacuum chambers and the lasers and everything uh, for this thing. So why set up LIGO India? The great uh, goal of LIGO India is to improve the precision with which we know where the gravitational wave uh, coalescence happened. And with our current detectors, we have a very big error ellipse and LIGO India uh, coming online would reduce this anywhere between a factor of 50 to 100. Okay. And if, uh, this will make a big difference to doing astronomy with gravitational wave events. So this is a joint Indo-US project with NSF on the US side and Department of Atomic Energy and Department of Science and Technology in India. Uh, as mentioned, the LIGO Laboratories is run by Caltech and MIT and there are four lead institutions in India. But in addition, there are about uh, 15 other institutes in India who are involved in various ways uh, with the LIGO India uh, uh, adventure. So the proposed Indian commitment is almost everything. We construct, operate this detector, we will set up the infrastructure, the ultra high vacuum. What's coming from the US are these key hardware components. Remember I mentioned to you very carefully that each of them is built by some international collaboration, right? So these are really unique. So even if we were to build it ourselves, we would go to the same people and get them. 
because there's no one country which has all these hardwares. But it so happened that LIGO US had already acquired an extra copy of this uh, hardware components uh, for historical reasons. And that is being sent to us. Uh, it's valued at about $140 million. And of course, we have been very close technology collaboration with the LIGO uh, Laboratories US in doing this because they've gone this path before. So LIGO India, the main science goal is to allow full exploitation of this gravitational wave observations as an integral part of multi-message astronomy. It brings in high-end frontier technologies. So it's transformational uh, for you know, various areas like photonics, lasers, control systems, vacuum. It has a strategic Indian geographical advantage because it gives you a big baseline, which allows this uh, you know, kind of fine uh, precision with which we can locate our source on the sky. But that's not all. India brings to this collaboration the demographic advantage. I can't think of any other country which can grow a scientific uh, manpower base in a new area uh, faster than India. And I think you know, over the 10 years, I'm really confident to say that we have done a great job in doing so. And it brings in research opportunity at home for undergraduates and postgraduate students brings you know a lot of new things for the researchers to pass on to their students this uh, endeavor has had top level support so the prime minister of india personally was present at the signing of the mou between uh, the nsf and department of atomic energy department of science technology on the other side uh, on you know in march 2016 and he has been following up uh, personally uh, all through uh, our progress. Uh, why so? Because it really is an amazing project because it, it's not just astronomy, which is shown in green or physics, which is shown in yellow. These are really great things that will happen with LIGO India or any such detector and precision measurements, of course. But this thing in red is something that you should look at. These are the technologies frontiers that will be pushed up by a few notches because we have to create uh, apparatus of that kind in India. Similarly, the same for our ability to process data and compute, okay? And of course, as I said, there's a huge dividend in terms of you know, the excitement it brings to the next generation. So let me just give you an idea of scale of things that we'll do. So we will set up this vacuum system, which is four kilometers long, the intricate set of vacuum chambers. And uh, this vacuum system holds 10 million liters at an ultra high vacuum of 10 to minus nine torrs, okay? Which is, you know, extremely, which is called ultra high vacuum. It's a technical word for that. And this is, would be amongst the largest vacuum systems in the world. Now, all the LIGO detectors at four kilometers are the largest uh, ultra high vacuum systems. So these are recent from your town and my town now. Uh, these are these chambers, uh, you know, first ones built at a facility, at an industrial facility in New York, uh, in, in Bangalore. Uh, and you can see these are mammoths. So you can't, I have given you the dimensions, but it's easy to see the people standing in front of this chamber when it was delivered. It was transported from Bangalore to Indore, where it is part of, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, a facility at uh, Center for Advanced Technology in Indore, which houses these chambers now. Okay, because they are setting up a small uh, 10 meter prototype of the LIGO for training purposes. And what these people would do is to figure out how to set up this optical system for this uh, apparatus. Then there was a huge story of looking for the site for this detector. So this was something that I was personally involved in starting from 2011, like Professor Bala here having accompanied me on the first site searches. And uh, by 2016, we had homed in on a site uh, in Maharashtra, 
Eastern Maharashtra. And uh, this is all given in a site selection report. And I wanted to show you why this is important because it sits on the Deccan Plateau. And Deccan Plateau is known to be seismically the quietest, one of amongst the quietest places on earth. So this is an excellent site and uh, to build on. Lots has happened on the site. These are early pictures when we started putting, marking out where things will be on the site. We excavated a bit of the site to see how costly the excavation is or what is the challenges. There were 200 such stations which did the geotechnical survey. Now we have a site office. Uh, this is a, dated by a few months. I'm sure they must have painted it over now. There's a, you know, all weather system, the entire place is fenced up. We have a guest house in the neighboring city, uh, town, and we have another campus land uh, at Nandit. So this site is about 70 kilometers from Nandit in uh, Maharashtra in the district called Hingoli. So this is our story and we hope to be operating uh, soon after 2026. Uh, there has been a little hit to our timeline because of the pandemic, but we will have to assess uh, how we are doing now. I will now turn to the future ground facilities that have been talked about, just to tell young people here that LIGO India itself will take you a couple of decades, but when you are my age, you might wonder, are there new things to be worrying about? And there are already ground facilities which are in concept or proposal stage. There's a 40 kilometer detector being proposed in the US called Cosmic Explorer. You can Google it and you'll find a lot of information about it. So there's um, two detectors, one 20 kilometers, one 40 kilometers. And this will happen somewhere uh, in the ballpark figure of 2040. Okay, and this will map out, uh, be capable of detecting any coalescence event that happens in our observable universe. So it's an amazing thing that uh, these concepts ring. In the European community, they have proposed an underground facility, which is one kilometer underground, 10 kilometer arm length in this triangular configuration with lasers running through them. This is again 2035, maybe 2040 called the Einstein telescope. And these are really exciting developments which will take it to the third decade from now. So at this point, let me uh, sort of pause a bit. So there are four windows that we know in which we can probe gravitational waves. And these probe different frequencies, just like in electromagnetism, we have X-ray probes, we have gamma ray probes, we have infrared probes, we have optical probe, radio. Similarly, here there's something at milliseconds, uh, which is the LIGO detectors, which has already opened in 2016. There is another one which will open up from space based detectors, uh, which will be lower frequency than that. Already there's a pursuit of uh, gravitational wave detection using radio antenna, where GMRT is also part of the you know, uh, international pulsar timing array. And, you know, it's, it's kind of hope that somewhere in this decade, uh, this might light up in terms of seeing some first detections. And there's another exciting area, which is the gravitational waves from the very beginning of the universe. And so I'd like to take a pause here and let Ajit uh, sort of tell me how to uh, as it can, sir, I can some answer some of the questions that have come till now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tharun, for giving this uh, really nice summary of this very exciting uh, research frontier um, and this adventure of LIGO India as well. Um, we have some interesting questions. I, I will try to group them in terms of content. And uh, one is uh, comparing gravitational waves with uh, electromagnetic waves. It one is um, it's sort of surprising um, that gravitational waves are sort of similar to electromagnetic waves in terms of speed and the number of polarization states. Um, do uh, we have an understanding about this sort of this coincidence? That is a fundamental a explanation. very good question. There's a, a very fundamental theorem. It has to do with symmetries of quantum fields and uh, 
any massless excitation uh, has the speed of light. It's forced to be by the symmetries. So it's a mathematical kind of a statement uh, that any massless uh, excitation. So the fact that gravitational waves are, move at the speed of light, which we have verified to extraordinary accuracy of 10 to the minus 15, uh, tells you that the excitations of space-time are indeed massless. Uh, theoretically, we expect them to be in Einstein's theory, but uh, it need not have been so. And also the same theorem tells you that there can be only two polarization states for these massless particles. Okay, these are mathematical statements. Uh, and uh, so it's beautiful that symmetry of you know, interactions uh, define for you these two statements that we are trying to verify. However, the polarization modes of gravitational waves are actually different from the polarization modes. Right, they are somewhat diff uh, they are different. Uh, electromagnetic uh, polarization states are 90 degrees apart, whereas that's because they are, uh, you know, excitations of the electric field, right? So they have whereas the gravitational wave itself is a shear field. So in terms of, again, mathematically, the, it's the spin of the excitation. So electromagnetic waves have a spin one, whereas uh, gravitational waves are spin two. And all spin two excitations have this, uh, are, arise from the shear nature. So shear is some stretching, like you take a matchbox and don't compress it, but you do this and it changes into a rhombic shape. That degree of freedom is called shear, and gravitational waves is a, are actually doing that to space time. And such things naturally, again, are, have a spin to nature, which is uh, polarization states, which are 45 degrees apart from each other. Thank you, Zerun. So you gave this very sort of quick and nice summary of some of the very important discoveries from um, gravitational observations. Could you sort of um, illustrate what are the qualitative differences of the sort of information that we will get from gravitational observations as compared to those okay. from electromagnetic observations? So a few points I wanted to make, uh, because I, I should also mention that I got into gravitation because I was aware of this field, uh, but this terrestrial based thing, uh, based on certain things that really are exciting about this field. Uh, gravitational waves, when you detect gravitational waves, say from a merger, you actually peer into the heart of the dynamical system where these things are moving, where things are being churned. Electromagnetic interactions, even if you see a neutron star merger, everything that we see in electromagnetism is actually from a shell, from a photosphere, which is far bigger than the heart of the neutron star merger. So that's because gravitational waves are weakly coupled to matter and they can come out unscathed from the event. So they are very pure probe of dynamics of uh, matter in the universe. So that's a very, very big thing. The other thing I should uh, point out is gravitational waves are ubiquitous. Okay, so the universe is buzzing with gravitational waves. Even when you know I wave my hand around, I'm creating gravitational waves, but they're tiny but everything that happens in the universe. So we are bathed in gravitational waves because you see why, because uh, in uh, nuclear processes, you can convert 0.05% uh, of the mass uh, of a nu nucleon to get this atom bombs. Mm -hmm. Here we are converting three solar masses of energy at one go, okay? And it's unbelievable, the energy you know, imagine what happens in the most powerful nuclear event in terms of mass to energy conversion to what has happened in this event. There's no comparison. This is like three suns disappearing and becoming radiation, uh, you know, according to e equal, e equal to mc square. And so the universe is buzzing with gravitation waves. We just have to have finer years to start detecting them at all frequencies. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Saran. So the next uh, set of questions is related to the sort of strength of um, a gravitational waves, uh, which is sort of relate to the, the point that you made. So uh, do these ripples uh, die down with 
time, um, you know, as, as they progress. And uh, secondly, if yes, what is the sort of signal to noise ratio that we are um, uh, observing at, at these detectors? Um, there are uh, two related questions. One is, what is causing this measurement errors? What is causing the noise? Um, and do atmospheric effects affect the signal? Okay. So basically, there are so, four questions. Yeah, there are quite a few things. So one is gravitational waves are weak because one way to look at it is there are ripples on the, the you know, space-time membrane. And if I try to set up ripples, it depends on how stiff the medium is. So if I'm trying to set up ripples on the surface of water, it's fairly easy. But if there was something stiffer than that, then it would be getting not viscous, I meant stiffer, right? So on a metal plate, if I wanted to create ripples or something stronger. Gravitation, uh, the space-time membrane is extraordinarily stiff in, you know, dimensionless units tend to have 40 times, you know, anything that you see in terms of matter uh, systems, okay? So that is why even a enormous event of three solar masses changing into energy causes very limited deformation to the space. And these ripples are mild to begin with, and just like any source of light, as it goes out, the amplitude of that wave falls off as one over distance. Okay. Here I should also mention a big difference between electromagnetic observations and gravitational waves. In electromagnetic observations, typically you always measure, measure intensity, which falls off as one over r square. In gravitational waves, we are measuring uh, the amplitude. And so our actually signal, we are more sensitive to uh, distant signals in a very major way. But nevertheless, you know, when the light, uh, the gravitational waves have traveled 1 billion, uh, you know, uh, years, they have traveled a considerable distance in the universe. And the amplitude falls off by that factor. And by the time they get to Earth, they are at the levels that we are talking about now. Okay. Secondly, why is it challenging? First of all, first of all, to even measure these tiny deflections, as I told you, you have to set up a four kilometer apparatus, but that's not all. You have to isolate the apparatus. So any point, place that you are standing on earth typically is rumbling at micron level. Okay? Mm -hmm. in, in any point in Bangalore, it's probably much more because of the cars and all, but even if you go to a very isolated place, the earth rumbles. And part of that actually is because of the sea hitting the coast. So when we search for the site, we actually had a criteria of being at least 100 to 300 kilometers away from the coast. Okay, so most of our sites are in the central part of India. Also, you cannot be near seismic zones because if there are too many events happening, then shaking the ground. So there's a huge, you know, the uh, constraint in looking for a site. So we had to be 10 kilometers away from any uh, road, you know, serious highway, uh, 20 kilometers away from any railway, 60 kilometers away from uh, airports. And that's very interesting. That's because you talked about this atmospheric uh, disturbances. Uh, you have to, first of all, avoid being in the flight path from that airport. And even then, you have to be far away so that by the time of flight is overhead, it is sufficiently high because we can detect them. We can detect the pressure waves that are coming from the uh, from a normal passenger flight. Jet fighters are a no-no, right? Hmm. So we ruled out sites uh, in northern Karnataka because of the Air Force base in Bidar, and because you know they take routine flights. And those, those can really, you know, uh, disturb you a lot. Uh, similarly, within the apparatus, of course, the mirror is at room temperature, it vibrates. I told you the way we manage that is to have the whole mirror system at a very high uh, Q, which is called resonance, uh, width of the resonance, so that uh, we can isolate those modes far away from our interest. Then we also have these stacks of isolation, which I did not mention the number, but it's a, we isolate the ground vibration by a factor of 10 to 12. 
by the time we it's come to the mirror right so these are the noises but even after doing all that those noises are there at the level of the signal and uh, we were lucky with the first source which kind of stood out uh, pretty clearly uh, although you know but typically you don't have things in particular the neutron star merger was well under the noise curve and it is only very smart uh, you know analysis that allows you to do that which is was what was championed by sanjeev durandar uh, and many others around the world but in india by sanjeev durandar this group and also you, to detect these signals you need to know the waveform extremely well so we need to know what to expect to be able to detect most of the signals only few of them stand out so loud that uh, you can do it without uh, modeling mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Tarun. So, can you take one more questions before you move on? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. So, this is also sort of then I think naturally um, uh, reaches to my next question. So, you you sort of touched upon the sort of noise sources that that limits our measurement and also some of the technology that is required for uh, building these detectors. Could you sort of elaborate on some of this cutting edge technology used in LIGO? and explain why is it yeah, challenging? Yeah, so that will be good. So as I said, uh, one of the things that limits the size of the mirror is how big a piece of glass of pure quality that you can cast, such that it has very high purity of crystalline structure in it. You know, this not crystal. I mean, it is something which really determines your performance. Uh, you have to polish it, of course, to great accuracy, but you have to coat it also such that the coating does not disturb all these nice things that you got by casting this glass. So these are really unique. I think there's a lab uh, in one country which can cast this and a lab or, or actually an industry which can polish it and another one which can coat it. Okay. The laser light is extremely pure in terms of its wavelength. It's also very stable. Uh, these are all roughly at the level of one billion, part in a billion, right? The frequency shifts are one part in a billion. The you know, amplitude uh, of the laser fluctuates by that. But again, these are far larger than the signal that you are measuring. And you really need very sophisticated optics to get to the uh, signal that you are seeking to uh, measure. And that's where it's very important to realize that you set off, Einstein set us off. Uh, he didn't set us off, but he predicted these signals. But I, people like Kip Thorne actually set off the entire community saying, oh, this can be detected. And you know, this was around the time people realized gravitation waves just like light can be, you know, kind of, can, there can be apparatuses that react to it. Okay, because GR is so complicated that these things took decades to do it. But then for four decades, you had to have people around the globe as well as largely these collaborations, which had to pursue it uh, with the best uh, technology that you could uh, put. Uh, what else? I mean, there is, I mean, and also the, what excites me rather than going to all the sources, I mean, of course, the vacuum system, for example, if it is not nanotor, even if there's a little bit of residual gas in the pipe, they'll scatter the laser light and create phase noises, which are far larger than what we can tolerate. And that is why the vacuum system that we are setting up is not just technically the unique, but it's required for the science school. It's absolutely required. And then there are isolation systems, mechanical things. So it's a, it's a thing which is a kind of a fairy tale thing for an engineering graduate to come to. Because every aspect that you may have learned about, you know, this is the most advanced system along that line. The control systems, I didn't get to that. One thing that allows us to operate this, are uh, this 10,000 control system loops uh, that are always going on. And you know, anyone who deals with such things can, you know, for them, many of the other control systems we talk about in other contexts are really a piece of cake. Mm -hmm. okay? So it's, it's absolutely a very complex uh, apparatus uh, that, that uh, defines the boundaries of what is possible. Mm -hmm. 
Can, can you give us also a sen sense of the sort of spin-offs that uh, such technology has produced in the context of BICO? Yeah, so this uh, laser locking itself, uh, it goes by the name of pound river mechanism, pound river hall mechanism. Oh, Driver, yeah. Ron Driver was one of the champions. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away very soon uh, after the detection. Uh, and he was not active for a, for a decade before that, but he was one of the experimentalists. Uh, then there are many, many ways in which, you know, smart things that are done with how to, you know, modulate a laser light with electromagnetic uh, interactions, uh, you know, with uh, ray, at radio frequencies in, and optic, so it's called electro-optic uh, modulation. There are systems that have been created under the LIGO India, uh, not LIGO India, in the LIGO scientific collaboration to make these detectors that are now part of technology that is coming out. The isolation stacks, for example, it's not that the gravitational waves are the only ones that need isolation. Every apparatus that you see in a high-end physics lab has isolation from seismic thing. If someone requires more than what is commercially available, then we have on offer platforms which are extraordinarily isolated from the seismic thing. So I can imagine other faces in the country borrowing some of these ideas and even probably apparatus to do that control systems, as I said. And so these are all you know, direct spin-offs. In terms of material science, which catches a lot of attention, the coating is always something interesting because it brings to the forefront some material properties that are unique, right? In terms of vibrational thing. There's also a possibility that the next upgrade at a very late stage, probably a decade from now, would be something with the optics being silicon wafers of massive size. And they are silicon, although it looks opaque at our, to the eye, are transparent to two micron uh, laser. And that's amazing because uh, what we are trying to harness is a physical property of uh, silicon that at uh, minus 170 Kelvin uh, uh, degree centigrade, it uh, does its thermal expansion coefficient goes to zero. So it really gives you an excellent uh, mechanical uh, vibration uh, free apparatus without going to really cryogenic, very much more colder cryogenic temperatures. And these would obviously have huge impact on technology. Okay. I, okay, thank you, Varun. So yeah. the next question naturally leads to a next part of your talk. Is it possible to detect the gravitational waves from Big Bang? So I guess you can start. Yes, yeah, so that part. is the next excitement. And I'll, I don't didn't put it in my slides, but I'd invite you to listen to the Nobel lectures uh, of uh, Raina Weiss and Pip Thorne, both mention that the next big thing to look forward to is gravitational waves from the beginning of the universe. Okay, and we uh, have been pretty close to it. Okay, uh, of you know within the our theoretical expectations, there was also a false uh, start. We thought we detected it, but it turned out not to be correct. But uh, so we are there and that happens whenever you're very close to detecting something that's happening with the pulsar search also, pulsar based search also. So these are areas which can suddenly spring a surprise and there's major collaborations, uh, collaborative efforts which are searching for this uh, from the ground as well as from space. And uh, so the next part of my talk is about that quest that uh, uh, we are trying to be part of from India. Uh, so thank you, Zaren. Why don't you uh, continue with that second part? Okay, now. so as I said, this window in milliseconds has opened up in 2016. This will open up whenever LISA flies in 2030s. And then pulsar timing array, you know, is kind of always very close to promising to see coalescence of supermassive black holes. Okay, that's an amazing thing. And then this is, as I said, the most fascinating possibility that we actually can peer back to the beginning of the universe. And that again relates to gravitational beings untouched uh, and you know, un, 
uncontaminated. And they bring you news right from the beginning of the universe. So what, what is the challenge there? Before I go there, I should just mention that uh, a bit about Lisa. And Lisa is something that is going to happen because technically we have achieved the goal required for three space uh, uh, satellites. These are satellites, they're not connected to each other. They are about 2.5 million kilometers apart. And they're following Earth in a triangular or you know, configuration. And there are laser lights being exchanged between them. And they work with the same idea that gravitational waves will perturb the satellites and they'll detect it. There are extreme challenges with that. And it's so much so that there was a space mission devoted to just demonstrating that that technology is mature enough. Uh, that was called the Pathfinder and that was extremely successful. So much so that I wanted to show it that this was the requirement of the Pathfinder and the Lisa, uh, Pathfinder requirement. This is what is required for LISA. And this is in how isolated can the test masses be in this uh, uh, space craft, which is moving around so much. And what they were able to show with the Pathfinder is you can keep a mass isolated within a spacecraft the accuracy is much higher than what is even required for LISA. So LISA is a sure go and, you know, most likely one, you know, uh, Ashok mentioned about James Webb Space Telescope. So if you are thinking of another fairy tale kind of space mission, LISA would be another thing, you know, uh, very, very inspiring, very, very fantastic uh, when it goes up. So let me get to this quest for seeing the gravitational waves from the origin of the universe. So again, you need an apparatus. So for example, for LIGO, we are building the apparatus on Earth. For Pulsar Search, we are actually banking on natural clocks, which are pulsars, and monitoring their motion uh, to detect gravitational waves. But for gra seeing gravitational waves on cosmological scales from the beginning of the universe, we have another natural apparatus available. So if you are here and now you look back, look far out into the universe, you're looking back in time, you, any observer in the universe and including us, when he peers back about 43 billion light years, so this is gigaparsec and we translated it's 43 billion light years, away there's a plasma shell which is surrounding us from where there is light, which is called cosmic micro background, which is shining on us from this shell. Okay, now imagine the shell to be the structure that we are trying to probe because gravitational waves, as I said, squeezes and stretches space time. So it would squeeze and spray, stretch this plasma shell that is around us and distort it. And those distortions, uh, were created by very early phenomena in the universe called inflation. And this is again a pure quantum origin uh, perturbation. So when we see these gravitational waves, we'll be detecting quantum fluctuations. And this quantum fluctuation seeded all the structure that we see, all the galaxies and clusters and superclusters, include our solar system. They were all seeded at the beginning from these quantum fluctuations. This is again a fantastic story uh, that we are setting out to, you know, the quest is to establish it observationally. So this is the shell. And when gravitational waves, what gravitational waves from the beginning of the universe does is to imprint a distortion onto it. So this is of course a very exaggerated view of the plasma shell being distorted when a gravitational wave of cosmological size you know, impinges from the top onto the shell. Okay, now what it does is when we look at the microwave sky, this is the entire sky. Astronomers have this habit of mapping the entire sky into these equal area projections. We used, have, have been very successful in measuring the temperature fluctuations and to a great extent, a polarization pattern, pattern of polarization in the cosmic microwave background that has richly you know, kind of defined the cosmology now. Okay, so we understand cosmology very, very well from right from, you know, when it was a few days old, uh, thanks to this kind of uh, 
uh, you know, observations. There have been three space missions devoted to it. Uh, the Cosmic Background Explorer in 1990s, when I started my research, uh, my first work was on that. And then in the 20, just at the turn of the millennium, there was some uh, mission from NASA called WMAP, where we worked with the data that they produced. And then we are actually part of the plant collaboration, which in the, the last decade, uh, 2010 to 2020, has dominated cosmology with its results. But these missions have not been sensitive enough yet to see a particular kind of pattern in these sticks that you see. These sticks are actually polarization angles of the microwave background as you look at different directions in the sky. And you can see that these are cartwheel kind of patterns that we expect from primordial gravitational waves. And we have not seen them yet. They could be anything at the level of 10 to 100 nano Kelvin. Okay, just to tell you, I, you know, normally this would come a bit late into cosmology talk. So the microwave background, this glow from this plasma surface is at three Kelvin. Okay, the fluctuations that you see in color have a RMS of 70 micro Kelvins, five orders of magnitude smaller. And these are precursors of all the structures that you see in the universe. The, there are two kinds of polarization pattern. There are radial and tangential ones, which are at five micro Kelvin. We have detected them, but we are looking for this wall patterns in polarization that are a telltale signature of primordial gravitation waves. So it suggests that we have three missions that have been very successful in mapping out the cosmic microwave in the sky. But there's enough room for another, yet another mission because 90% of the information that is hidden in this polarization pattern is still not uh, detected because we don't have the sensitivity for it, okay? And that's what we are setting out to do in this next quest. We want to, we are proposing a near ultimate CMB polarization survey. I won't get into the specifics. It would be, you know, having the best specs possible because we have, you know, trying to build upon there's three decades of extremely successful missions and we want to do better than all of them by a huge factor, okay? But the scientific promise that I want to point out is that it will detect the primordial gravitational waves from, it promises to detect the gravitational waves from the beginning of the universe and that will have transformational implications for ultra high energy physics. Okay, it will tell you what kind of physics operated in the earliest moments of the universe. And as I said, these are of quantum origin in a space time, early space time. And so these are really signatures of quantum gravity that we'll first see. So this, I mean, I would say is a sheer shot if when that happens is a Nobel Prize dream. Okay, and it will do a lot of things on the way to this prized uh, thing. Uh, it would, you know, kind of map out uh, cosmology in a much, much deeper way and leave a legacy of, you know, things for astronomers and cosmologists. So in 2018, we made a proposal to ISRO uh, from this collaboration called CMB Bharat. And uh, the proposal is still under consideration. Uh, we have been discussing the technology benefits of it and various aspects because it is an expensive proposal. It will be done in international collaboration, but you know, only once we get a go ahead uh, from ISRO to look at uh, partners, but we have indicated our partners uh, from Europe and uh, US. So NASA and ESA, if they bind, there will be a combined kind of a proposal. It will send a satellite which about uh, weighs about two tons, uh, has a diameter of 4.4 meters, and a height of four meters. And we can adjust a bit around it. Of course, these are very preliminary designs that we have put forward. But our goal was to fit the satellite into the fairing of the largest launcher that we have in ISRO, which is JSLV Mark III, okay? And we'll have to launch it in a unique spot, which India has not probed yet. James Webb Telescope is headed there. This is called the second Lagrange point. So this is about 1.5 million kilometers from Earth. So you can see the Earth's moon distance is much smaller than that. It's away from the sun. 
and the satellite always looks away from the sun so that there's no contaminating uh, you know contamination due to the bright illumination of the sun and it's away from earth moon system so any disturbance of that from reflected light as well as earth is pretty noisy uh, already uh, in terms of electromagnetic radiation it pours out and so it is going to look around and map the same sky with unprecedented accuracy and uh, but the heart of this whole project are the detectors okay and this is again breaching a boundary so now what are the most sensitive detectors we have so typically when we talk about power detection detection of electric power in electromagnetism uh, we have talking about megawatt power plants we talk about milliwatt lasers that are there in your pointers we also, not too many people would know that the FM signal that comes to you is already at the level of nanowatts, okay? So the radio that you have, FM radio, is a sensitive detector which can detect nanowatts of power. Your cell phone can detect picowatts of power, okay? So this has some bearing on people's worry about radiation uh, from, you know, the towers. So basically our cell phone doesn't require much of power to transmit between signals. But uh, here we would need to go to detectors which can detect power at attowatts, 10 to minus 18 watts. Okay, and not just one of them, we'll have to put them, many such detectors in huge arrays of say 2000 or 8000 detectors at the heart of this experiment, these detectors operate at uh, 0.1 Kelvin temperature above zero. So these are extremely uh, you know, the sensitive detectors. They have to be placed housed in cryogenic uh, structures. And that cryogenic structure has to be inside a satellite. The satellite must have a way to keep that cryogenic structure going. Typically in a lab, you have liquid helium, which is used, but we can't carry liquid helium uh, in large quantities in the satellite and run out. So there are very, very exciting things, which at the heart is this detector, but to make the detector work is the infrastructure, thermal infrastructure, you have to isolate because on one side of the satellite, you'll have solar panels, which are being heated to uh, room temperature. And at this heart of the satellite are these detectors, which need to stay at 0.1 Kelvin above. And this whole thing has to be the apparatus or the lab to do that uh, is of the size of four meters, right? So this is technology that ISRO has yet not uh, mastered in terms of the cryogenic uh, facility. And we don't have a cryogenic facility uh, space mission. We don't have detectors of this quality yet in India, but there are attempts to get to that. And uh, these, there are other challenges which are just dropped by this, but the telescope optics has to be made up of silicon carbide, which is something that ISRO has been pursuing as a program. And so this is again yet another thing where we would hopefully bring everything together and as I said, it's been more than a decade since we launched our most successful CME mission till date, the Planck satellite from ESA, and we are part of it. So hence that community that has grown in India has been ambitious enough to propose this. And we hope, uh, you know, uh, ISRO uh, at some point would sort of uh, get into a study phase on this. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tarun, for this very uh, exciting prospects of, of probing the, the very early universe using um, uh, gravitational waves. Um, we do have a couple of more questions. Um, uh, one is, um, so what, what is the sort of um, broad science that um, the observation of gravitational waves in the early universe can tell us. Uh, for example, can this be used to validate multiverse theory? Uh, 
not multiverse theory because multiverse theory by definition uh, involves causally disconnected parts of the universe and you know there's no physics that i can think of where you be uh, you know seen except for very extraordinary circumstances where you imagine two parts of the universe colliding with each other but you know you won't set up a billion dollar satellite to look for some things and uh, but this is a much more guaranteed signal what it will bring to you is if you know the level at which the signal exists it just you can read off the energy scale at which the high, you know highest energy scale relevant physics happened in the universe okay and we believe it is the grand unified theory scale of 10 to 16 gv so it will be you know probing the physics you know many many orders of magnitude higher than uh, the best detectors uh, you know collider physics that we have which is about 10 tev right so this is 16 plus uh, 3 so about 10 to our 20 or, or 10 10 to our 18 orders of magnitude higher energy scale than something that we can probe now mm -hmm. so are there, there are also questions on whether this can probe quantum gravity it can so this is uh, so there have been always questions asked about the uh, gravitational waves that we detect in ligo those are classical gravitational waves although we you have started using quantum measurements but that's the apparatus whose quantum behavior we are looking at we the, these sources of gravitational waves produce classical gravitational waves but the signal that we expect from the earliest moment of the universe is inherently quantum mechanical okay and that's the biggest uh, surprise in cosmology that we expect that everything that we see in the universe arose from quantum fluctuations and once we detect this we put that idea which is transformation for human beings like mm -hmm. you know we had carl sagan say we are all made of stardust and that was transformational to the you know population because you realize that everything that you see on earth basically all the elements were generated in stars but this is something way way beyond and which is why you know kip thorn and renaways mentioned them in the so this is telling you everything that we have in the universe every creation not just us anything that we see in the universe arose from quantum fluctuations thank you sir that's a very uh, amazing thing about um could you maybe the the last question um so you you uh gave a sense of the kind of technological challenges involved both in the ligo as well as the, the cmb experiments so could you uh, give us a, a sense on of the broader challenges involved in carrying out such frontier science projects in a country like this as well as the opportunities they provide to the country at large yes yeah, so these pursuing such frontier quest which required necessarily required large teams is something that is not as uh, well pursued in india for the size of the country i'm not saying there's no, nothing happening but not enough is happening and actually the scientific culture is yet to adopt that as a mainstream so there are occasional things that are happening but you know this is important that you notice that the major leaps that most places have made are because they wanted to do something extraordinary and that requires not uh, that requires scientists to get together team together work within a team and not just scientists science and technology have to work together this is something that i have been crying myself hoarse that you can't have science happen unless you pair it up very well with technology so we have to work shoulder to shoulder within the same umbrella uh, to work together and that's a cultural aspect so i remember giving an interview where i was asked what would like india what's the main thing that you expect like india to bring i said it will change the ethics of how science is done on a country level because you know working in a collaboration requires certain things which uh, working in a group does not in such group Uh, demand of you okay uh, and it requires also the appreciation of the fact that scientific management is something that's important 
you know, there have been major projects and see, we, we have countries which have gone through it. So even US had this thing of small groups and, you know, they, when they took up major projects in astronomy, there were projects which were about to fail, including LIGO itself, because what was not realized is the key element to success of that is the management, science management. And that is something that should be understood by the academia first, uh, tech, you know, including science and technology, also by funding agencies. I think they are more uh, in tune with that than the academia at this time in the country. And I think that's a strong message. And also we have to pair up with the industry, you know, science and, you know, we keep talking about academia and industry collaboration. What these projects bring out as collaboration is enormous. And these are actually the scale where industry should be interested in. One lab doing something high precision is not big enough business for a company to change its course. But something like LIGO India or CMB Bharat, you know, will do that. And just in terms of spin-off, I should mention that the 5G detectors that you carry in your phone, you know, this whole 5G business was in the labs in the late 90s in Caltech. I know people who have worked on that technology who are scientists at JPL now. So, you know, it, here, you know, there are also times, shorter time scales on which uh, things are translating into the household equipment. I mean, no one thought that those detectors will once be in your pocket, right? So imagine this after what thing, what it, you know, once we manage to make it something portable, what it will bring to us. Yeah, thank you, Zerun. This is a, a very, very good point. And um, could you please also give us a sense of how um, people outside the in academia, like our friends from the alumni network of IITs, you know, are very closely involved with the high tech industry and civil society, etc. How can they sort of contribute to this endeavor? I mean, they are vital to it. Uh, I should first segment I should make is any adoption of this whole culture requires a societal adoption. If the society thinks these are exciting to do, like at some point, US turned around and said, we want to send the first man to moon. You know, that kind of a society response to these quests is vital, right? There has to be, which requires the society to be educated uh, about these things. We need to reach out and tell them what is exciting. The alumni here is particularly a section of the society which also understands the technology and science behind it far, far above what a general population would be aware of. Mm -hmm. And they are also in positions often to help. I mean, all through the LIGO project, I have reached out to my alumni batchmates, starting from people who are in the government sector for you know, our site search and you know, how to go about such things, how to make sure, you know, procedures to technical things of, you know, how things are built, uh, where is the best lab available, which is the industry which can, for example, take up LIGO India on the larger scale. We are talking to the biggest uh, players in the field now uh, because uh, the major construction phase uh, will start soon. And we are already in discussions. And there I have benefited from talking to, picking up the phone, talking to one of the alumni. And they have put me in touch with the key people in those industries, uh, which allows a much, you know, it gives you an uh, informal channel, which allows the industry to actually appreciate the science code uh, rather than just respond to a tender. I mean, which everyone will have to do. But, you know, this whole idea of, you know, why it's exciting, why should the industry get into it, is best transmitted from scientists and technologists directly to colleagues in the industry. Okay, thank you, Tarun, for this very exciting um, uh, webinar and answering the questions. Uh, let me hand over this mic to Professor Narayan now for the concluding remarks. Yeah, uh, thanks, Ajit. Uh, and uh, thank you, Tarun, uh, Dr. Tarun Chorudip, for a fantastic talk. Thank you, sir. Uh, I walk home very enriched uh, this weekend, you know, uh, really got informed and actually learned quite a bit. Uh, so you, you began with this wonderful lucid uh, description of the 2000, 
2015 event, you know, where the uh, scientists observed the ripples in the fabric of space time, you know, uh, arriving at uh, the Earth's surface from a catastrophic climatic event in a very distant universe, in a distant universe. So that uh, excitement you were able to convey and uh, really, uh, I mean, uh, on a perfect timing, this is a science day weekend, uh, you know, and Thank the you. 2015 also coincided with Einstein's uh, 1915 uh, prediction. So, uh, I mean, uh, I am uh, quite uh, always uh, thrilled to really listen to all this together today. And you spoke about the intricacies of the uh, well-planned, uh, ambitious LIGO India project. You know, uh, I uh, personally would like it to be a grand success. Uh, the spin-off technology, which you mentioned itself is revolutionizing. And I hope you get uh, all the hurdles removed and uh, complete support from the entire ecosystem. You know, and you also gave a wonderful tour on all the major projects worldwide, you know, and uh, so I, again, I feel very quite well informed and the questions from the audience were quite insightful and it was superbly moderated by Ajit, you know, so the next generation is really truly arrived in this field. Uh, and we had a later on had a very uh, good glimpse of the cosmology and the quest for the uh, primordial uh, gravitation uh, waves, which you explained, and the the kind of proposal which you put up is uh, really quite, uh, I mean, insightful and ambitious. Again, I wish uh, that you get uh, the proposal soon, and it also becomes a reality. You know, uh, and uh, with that, I wish everybody a very uh, nice weekend, and uh, thank you both, uh, Tarun and Ajit, uh, for this. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you. Thank you.